welcome. It is great to have you with us here this morning. As you can see, we're a little bit under construction up here, and it's going to keep going as the, year, as the uh, weeks and months go by. I invite you, if you're able, to stand with us as we sing. <laughs> Hey, it's good to have you here today. If you're a guest, we want to especially welcome you. 
Uh, in your bulletin is a opportunity to, for us to get to know you called the Connect Card. That's right. My wife is demonstrating. Kind of, the white. There we go. <laughs> and we'd like you to fill this out so we can have a record of being here today, get to know you a little bit better. And if there's a way we can serve you better, maybe you have a prayer request or a need, mark it on that card so we can be praying for you. If you'd like to get together with me, Mark your name and address, telephone number, I'll call you, we'll get together if I can help you with anything going on in your life. That's why I'm here. And if you fill that out for the first time today as you leave, if you give it to me, I'll give you a gift bag filled with all kinds of goodies. It's our way of saying thank you for coming today. Okay, let's continue our worship. Again, it's good to have you here today. Okay, you got a little break, but I'm going to ask you again. If you're able, let's stand as we sing. Crown him with many crowns.
begins the celebration of Valentine's Day. And many of you may not be aware of Valentine's Day, but really it's kind of a day that Hallmark Cards invented the Selmo Cards back in the late 1800s. But men, you know what you got to do, okay? So don't forget. But when we talk about Valentine's Day, the word love comes up. Love is one of the most overused and misunderstood words in our English language. Love can mean lust. It can mean romantic love. You can say, I love my new car, but I don't think you love your new car the way you love your wife. At least you shouldn't. <laughs> and God gave us a new definition of true love. It comes from the word of God. And I'd like just to read a passage out of the Bible to remind us that in our relationships, be it a marriage, friendship, our relationship with one another, our goal is agape love. And during Valentine's Day, what better time to, to uh, reflect than that? Found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, this passage often is quoted in marriage ceremonies, but it's meant for all of us, especially in the church. It says, beginning with verse 1, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love. I'm only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. As you think about your relationships today, I want, to, I want you all to evaluate. You say you love people. You love your wife. You love your husband. You love your kids. You love your friends. You love your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. That word can be thrown around a lot. Here is the criteria in which we need to evaluate our love. And during this time where we celebrate Valentine's Day, I hope that you'll evaluate your love. None of us hit a pluses in all these categories. Where does God want you to grow? You know, cards are great, candy's great, taking your, your spouse out to dinner is wonderful. I encourage you to do that. Uh, if nothing else, it'll keep you off the pookie list. But at the same time, if you live this out, what greater gift can you give to those you say you love than to love in this way? <coughs> Peter's statement of faith, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus said, I tell you you're Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. When others see with earthly eyes just what they
school, I was on the cross country and track team, had dreams of Olympic aspirations, in case you didn't notice I never made it. I remember running during the summer to get in shape. I'd run three miles, five miles. One day I was running, it was really hot, it was humid. I was getting the last half mile in before I got home, and I found myself slowly getting slower and slower and slower. You know, maybe you've been there before, there's just nothing left. You are at zero as far as fuel and energy. I was even thinking maybe it's time to walk a little bit. Well, about that time, this huge dog comes out of nowhere and goes on the attack. And to my utter surprise, I broke the world's record for the next half mile. I had never run so fast in my life. Where did that come from? I don't know. It was fear of the dog that caused me to go in hyperdrive. And when I got home, I just fell on my face, exhausted. As I look back, that big dog wasn't near as big as I thought it was. As it nipped in my heels, it was really just a medium-sized thing. But my fear made it bigger than it really was. Well, we're facing with the forces of Satan with something I call the hounds of hell. The hounds of hell are on the attack. Those are the demons that God's working. I mean, God's working against and Satan's using. Those hounds of hell are nipping in our heels. They're taking ground. Just like that dog felt that that street was his turf. Satan is starting to see this country as his country. And it's time to stand up to the hounds of hell. Because guess what? I went down that street a few days later. This time I had a two by four that I carried. <laughs> that dog came out again. I hit him once really good. I didn't kill him by any means. Suddenly that hound of hell that seemed so mean, so nasty, so big, whoo, he took off, yelping. And folks, understand something. As we're fighting the hounds of hell in our own lives, the life of our country, the life of our church, God has given us the power of victory. T take a look at, with me at Matthew chapter 16. Susan saying on this passage, when we have these words, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who, the people, who do the people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. <coughs> But what about you, Jesus asked, who do you say I am? I can almost imagine silence breaking out for a minute as they bolted over. You see, the disciples were still a little confused on exactly this Jesus they were following. They believed he was the Messiah, but what that meant, they weren't sure yet. Then in verse 16, Simon Peter spoke up and he answered. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The first time in Matthew that any disciple uttered those words. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or the gates of hell, will not overcome it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What we have is the most powerful statement ever uttered to this point in the Bible. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And today as we gather together, we need to understand that that's why we're here. This church needs to be built on that confession as Christ the Son of the living God. This shows that Peter had personal faith in Jesus Christ. It's not about what we do for God, though we should do for God out of gratitude. It's not power of our flesh and what we do in our own power, but it's God through the power of the Spirit of God. And understand something, as people are trying to search for God, no matter how much they search for Him, it's He that finds you. You see, Christ... It's not just one good way to heaven. 
Christ is not the best way to heaven. Christ is the only way to heaven. God, Christ is not a good answer to our problems. He's not the best answer to our problems. He is the only answer to our problems. And because of Peter's saving faith, he was blessed by Jesus in a special way. Jesus had planned Peter for leadership of the disciples. Why? Because Peter was hearing God. Not because he was a better person. We've seen Peter fail. He failed God over and over again, put his foot in his mouth. I always like to say that I really can relate to Peter because it's me. But one thing Peter was sure of is who Jesus Christ was. And God blessed him for it. Matter of fact, he blessed him so much, he said, and you are Peter. Now, that term, that name hadn't been used much at this point. He was telling the disciples, here is the man, the rock of his confession. That's why I'm going to use him. He was actually the original Rocky, okay? So next time you think of Peter, think of Rocky, okay? And Jesus would love to be able to call all of us Peter. But he can't. Because though we may utter the words, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, too often we don't live that which we speak. We don't really believe that which we speak. And thus we can't be called Peter. Now Peter failed. And I want to tell you right now is if you stand up and speak out and proclaim that confession who Christ is, that doesn't mean you're going to have a perfect track record after that. You are probably going to fail God more than once. But one thing about Peter, he got out there and he made it happen. He got out of that boat. He tried to walk on the water. He sank, but he's the only one that got out of the boat. During the day of Pentecost, it was Peter who got up and spoke out bravely, boldly, courageously among thousands of people, which 3,000 received Christ that day. Almost in the shadow of the temple, the very enemies of Christ were right there, but he boldly stood up and spoke out the power of God. What was Peter? He was willing. He was willing to speak out and practice that which God called him to practice. We all should be a Peter. How are you doing in that area? But it goes on and say, you are Peter. It goes on to say, Jesus says, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now there's been a lot of disagreement on what that exactly means. Our Roman Catholic friends argue that the rock that they're talking about is Peter himself. He was the first pope. Thus, it was on Peter, the man, that God built the church. Well, I don't agree with that. And obviously you don't either because you're here rather than the Roman Catholic Church down the road. I love them, but I don't agree with that. Who is, or what is the rock that Jesus is talking about? Well, there are two different interpretations that I think could be possible. One is the rock is Jesus himself. Okay? Upon this rock I will build my church. Me. The other interpretation that I prefer is Peter's confession of faith is the rock that will build the church of Christ. You see, it's not our programs that will build the church. It's not our innovation that will build the church. It's not our own personal efforts that will build the church of God. It is the power of our belief in Jesus Christ. And when we say that he is the the Christ, the Son of the living God, we will live it as Lord. And then he will empower us to do his will, his way. That is how we build the church. And why is the church so weak today? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is we're afraid of the hounds of hell. They're nipping at our heels. We're hiding in our buildings because the hounds of hell are out there screaming, barking at us. What's the virus? But another reason is we for too long have tried to build on ourselves on our own agendas, in our own power. We too often see this as our church, not God's church. We want it done our way rather than God's way. And understand that any agenda except the agenda of Jesus Christ is doomed to fail. When we build on the rock of the confession of Peter, and we're living that confession, we will see God move in a mighty way. 
In too many churches, it's not happening. Because our focus is wrong. What we're building on is wrong. We're trying to do it on our own, in our own power. And it goes on to say, who will build the church? It's not us. It's Jesus that builds the churches through us. Jesus. He is responsible for the results. Whose church is it? It's Jesus' church. Whose church is it? It's Jesus' church. Whose church is it? It's Jesus' church. Let's say it again. Jesus' church. The, G the church is not possessed by us. It is we who are possessed by Jesus. Amen. Are we building on the rock of Christ? The rock of that confession. And here's something very powerful. Verse 18. I gotta take a look at it here and read it to you yet again. It says, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. The word in the Greek is Hades. And what's being talked about here is the forces of evil. The gates of hell will not overcome it. You have been promised the victory. If we're not experiencing it, where's the problem? We have been told that God will overcome. If we're not seeing it, where's the problem? Is it because God's not powerful enough? Is it? No. Is it because Jesus can't do it? No. He can't hack it? We need to realize that we need to be on the offensive. Think about the gates. The gates are defensive instruments. What Jesus is saying is we need to be on the attack. Not hiding in our buildings. Not allowing the hounds of hell dip in our heels, running away in fear. We need to have them run away in fear because of the power of God through us. And we're told that we need to be literally attacking and beating down the gates of hell to invade his territory, his domain. It's time that we take back the land. It's time we take back our community for Christ. We're not, I'm not talking about politics. I'm not about the power of God working through us to change lives. Amen. We need to kick down the gates of hell. We need charge to the mouth of hell itself. And it's right out there, folks. The hounds of hell have taken too much land. It's time that we go on the attack. But you can't go on the attack when you're busy living your own life your way. You can't go on the attack when you're busy doing church your way. You can only go on the attack when God is the focal point of our lives. He is the priority. When I was in the Army, we were ready to go whenever we needed, we were called to go. We had alerts. We had to have our stuff packed. We had to be ready within an hour to show up and start getting on airplanes to go wherever the attack the enemy was. They didn't request it. They didn't say, hey, if you could work it to your schedule, would you be available to show up? And no one ever said, sorry, I got a dentist appointment today. I got my kids I got to deal with. I, I got other plans. I got to go play golf today. We were called anytime to go anywhere. Didn't make any difference whether it was your day off or you had other plans. Because we were in the Army. And the Air Force and the Navy and the Marines were the same way. We lived for one purpose. It was not for ourselves, for our country. To defend it. And we today as Christians are here for one purpose and one purpose only. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. Are you living that today? It's not about your agenda. It's about the will of God. Are you living that today? We can do a lot of good things. They're not bad. They're good. But if it crowds out the, the important thing, which is God, you're wrong. That can even include family sometimes. Right now, it doesn't look like victory in our country. It doesn't look like victory in our world. So where's the problem? To experience victory, we need to be a Peter in these ways. One, we need to listen to God. We need to proclaim the message. And we need to respond in responsibility. And Jesus ends with these words, which are very cryptic. And to this day, people disagree on what it means. Verse 19 has these words for us, where it says, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. That's kind of a weird 
response, isn't it? What he meant by the keys? Well, all of us have seen the things in books and TV where he has a picture of Peter with some keys holding on at the gates of heaven, letting people in and out. That's not what it means. It doesn't say the, key, the keys to heaven. It says the keys to the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is here today. We're a part of that kingdom of God right here in this world. So what does it, what's meant by the keys? Well, the keys are the authority, responsibility, and results of our work for God to reach those for Christ, to live a godly life. We hold the keys by our actions to make a difference in people's lives. We have that authority. We have that responsibility. And then God will see the results if we use the keys the way we should. Now, what's interesting is the Greek is a little different than the English. It's because there's a Greek tense that we don't have in the English language called the Greek uh, future imperfect paraphrastic. You don't need to remember that. You will not be quizzed. And what it means is this. It says, whatever you bind in earth will already have been bound in heaven. That's what it means literally in the Greek. So what's that mean? It means that we, we need to work in the will of God. When we work in the will of God and have the power of faith, we will accomplish anything and everything God wants us to accomplish, including digging down the gates of hell itself. We need to be sure, though, that we're not doing it in our own efforts, according to our own agenda, but we're doing it in the power of God, in faith, doing his will. When that happens, we will always win. Period. We will overcome. We will beat down the gates of hell. We will invade the domain of hell itself to retake lost ground. Are you handling the keys correctly? Do you even realize that you have the keys that we, when we do it in his will and his power, in faith, we can have victory? Remember the context. Peter had just made a great confession under the control of the Holy Spirit. While Peter was in the Spirit, the promise was given. We were listening and obedient to God under the control of the power of the Spirit. We will have the same supreme power that Peter had. Remember what happened? Pentecost again? How many people were saved? Five, ten, twenty, three thousand. Three thousand. Now I'm not saying we're going to have three thousand saved next week if we're handling the keys of the kingdom of heaven correctly. But what I can tell you is that we have the power to accomplish anything God wants. It's guaranteed when the hounds of hell are nipping at your heels, you can turn around and kick the living daylights out of the hounds of hell. Amen. And when you're in his power and, in, and doing it according to his will, you will always win in time. Now, sometimes those bales are pretty long. On June 6, 1944, we invaded France to retake Europe for Germany, from Germany. We were able to hold on to that ground that day and start moving in. On that day, when Hitler could not push us off those beaches, we had won the war. It was only a matter of time. It was already over. But it went on for almost another year because even though victory was certain, the battle continued. And what God's telling us here is victory is certain, but we've got to fight the battle. And during the next not 11 months that we fought. We lost some battles. We won more battles. But we had to fight every day. We didn't take the beaches and say, okay, we've won. Hitler, surrender. Satan's going to fight to the death, folks. We have been given the victory. Depends on how we're going to experience it. And understand the battle could be long. It can be difficult. But we can win. In Matthew 18, verses 18 and 19, we find out not just Peter was given those keys, all the disciples were. That includes us today. Are you ready to start using those keys to unlock the power of God in faith, according to his will, to do that which God has already determined before the beginning of time would happen? To change this world, not politically, not socially, but spiritually. The longer I do this job, the less I have.
have any kind of faith in what happens in Washington, D.C. or Jefferson City. Amen. I'm involved politically. That's not the answer. The answer is in Jesus Christ. Amen. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Now we turn to a different part of the service, and that is the Lord's Supper. And the reason that we should be excited, we should be pumped about serving God with every fiber of our being, every minute of the day, is what Jesus did for us. I want to read the passage to you. Down again in the book of Matthew. Beginning in Matthew chapter 27, verse 27. 